This is the video solution guide to the Lewis Structures and Polarity Practice Worksheet. This first compound, uh, nitrogen trifluoride, uh, first off, to start with the Lewis structure, uh, we know that nitrogen has five valence electrons. We know that fluorine has seven. Uh, things like halogens that only have kind of one attachment point, they're never really in the middle. Same thing with stuff like hydrogen, things that have one tend to not be in the middle. Uh, things that really like to be in the middle of these Lewis structures are like things that have four valence electrons. That's fantastic. Five is good. Six is also good. But like one and seven usually don't do. So uh, nitrogen is going to be in the middle, so we're going to draw it with five valence. Uh, I'm going to draw it maybe a little different than what we usually do, but here are the five valence electrons around nitrogen. And I think you can kind of figure out where these fluorines go. I'm going to switch my pen color, and you're going to get a fluorine, essentially, one on each, and then we're going to draw its lone electron, so they all have an octet, okay? And then, so when we go to draw this, anytime you have these shared pairs, they're going to be represented with a line. So I'm going to put nitrogen with its lone pair there. It's important to put those lone pair there because they are going to help determine the geometry of this molecule. Okay, so this would be an example of a Lewis structure for this compound. Okay, and so the next part asks, are the bonds polar or nonpolar? And so what we need to do is look at their electronegativity difference. Fluorine over here has an electronegativity of 4. Nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0, so if I subtract those 4 minus 3, that gives me 1.0 electronegativity difference, which definitely falls within the polar covalent portion. So this has polar bonds. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is look at the geometry. And so in looking at this, um, you want to count the number of effective pairs. So remember, a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, or two lone pairs all count as one. So around the central atom, we have one, two, three, four. So we have four effective pairs. And then we want to count the lone pairs. Well, on this diagram, it looks like there's only one lone pair. And so we look at this diagram, four effective pairs, which is here. Go over to one lone pair. It's uh, pyramidal. Okay, or a trigonal pyramid is the shape. Oops. Okay, so trigonal pyramid. Now we have to kind of stop and think what this looks like. Easiest way I can demonstrate this, let's go over to this thing. And so we had three bonding pairs and then we had one lone pair. Notice here it says the shape is the pyramid. When I rotate this guy around, you'll notice that it is asymmetrical, okay? It, it's not equal on all sides. It looks different. Things that are asymmetrical do not have bonds that are pulling in equal and opposite directions, so they won't cancel. And so, when we go back to this thing, uh, we're going to say that this is a polar molecule because it, is, it has asymmetry. And so when you go to draw this thing, um, you can draw it a number of ways. Um, you could put, since the fluorine is more electronegative, you could put these uh, lowercase deltas. Oops, and that's going to be negative, not positive. So this is slightly negative, this is slightly negative, this is slightly negative, and this would be a slightly positive portion. Or you could draw it like this if you want. And... I'm going to put the four fluorines here, and to demonstrate the electrons are moving that way, you could use this type of symbol, showing the electrons are being pulled down to the fluorines, positive end up by the nitrogen. Okay, next one. This would be hydroiodic acid. Okay, well, since it's only two, you know it's going to be linear. Hydrogen has one, iodine has seven, so this is what the Lewis structure is going to look like. Um, and like we said, there's only two. It's going to be linear. You don't even have to look at that chart. Um, so we need to look at their electronegativities. Um, 
let's see, iodine has an electronegativity of 2.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. That gives me 0.4. Um, you know, I tend to say, and there's no absolute answer, this is a, uh, a continuum, a spectrum, all right? So all bonds have some covalent properties and some ionic properties. Generally, that 0.4 is where I kind of do the, the cutoff in anything that's right on the line, it's the it's the next thing. So like uh, to point four, I'm gonna go that this has polar bonds. Okay, because this doesn't have an equal and opposite pole, this thing is gonna give us uh, polar geometry. So the electrons are gonna be pulled more to the iodine end, it's more electronegative. The remaining positive goes over to the hydrogen. So I would say this is a polar molecule. Okay, next, this is uh, boron triiodide. Um, this is one, boron is one that does not follow the octet rule. It only has five uh, protons, so it can't hold on to eight valence. So we're going to have fewer, but that's okay. Um, iodine, let's go over here, and you know iodine has seven, so it's going to attach in a way like this. All these guys in here. All right, then um, I'm going to give you a hint. So you look at this, it's going to share three pairs with no loan. So three pairs with no loan. It's trigonal planar. This means this thing is flat. Okay, and so I'm going to draw it in this fashion. I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute. We'll look at the uh, that FET simulation software just to verify what this looks like. Okay, so I'm going to go back over here. Let's clear this. And so it only has three bonding pairs, no lone pair in that central atom. And so if you look at it, it looks like an airplane propeller or a letter Y or something. Notice they're all flat and in one plane, right? So that's what a trigonal planar looks like three and then flat planar. Okay, uh, if I compare their electronegativities, iodine is 2.5 and bromine is 2.0, which gives me 0.5, which definitely tells me I have polar bonds. Okay, however, uh, oh, and let me write that down. Trigonal planar. Because it is perfectly symmetrical, the iodine, like this one's pulling against these two, this one's pulling against these two, this one's pulling against these two. They're all 120 degrees apart. They're all equal and they're all opposite. Their poles cancel out. So even though the bonds are polar, this is a nonpolar molecule. Why? Because it is symmetrical. Okay, next one, we have silicon tetrabromide. Uh, let's see here. Silicon's going to be in the middle. It has four valence. Okay, and bromine. Let's switch pen colors here. Bromine has seven. So it's going to attach on each side here. And so when you draw this, it's going to look like this. Oh, let's too close to the edge there. Okay. And I'll put all the lone pairs on here. So they all have their octet. Everybody's happy. Okay, look at this shape around the central atom. One, two, three, four. Affected pairs or shared pairs, no lone pairs. I use my diagram. Four affected pairs of no lone. This is a tetrahedron. This is a tetrahedral shape. Okay, if I compare their electronegativities, I look at them. Uh, silicon looks like it's 2.8, and bromine is 1.8, which gives me a difference of 1.0, which is definitely polar bonds. Okay. Now, once again, we need to look at this shape. So let's go back to our uh, what a tetrahedron actually looks like. Let's clear this off. We're going to put four things on here. 
with no lone pairs and lo and behold this is that tetrahedron it looks kind of like a pyramid with a hat sticking up but notice it is perfectly symmetrical this guy is pulling against these three this guy pulls against these three this guy pulls against these three this guy is pulling against these three so it is perfectly symmetrical no matter how you look at it so although the bonds are polar this once again is going to be a nonpolar molecule. Why? Once again, that symmetry cancels out all of those, uh, all of those, uh, I guess, polar bonds. Okay, the next one. This would be hydroselenic acid. Is really what this is, or hydrogen uh, selenide. And so selenium is going to be in the middle. Selenium over here should have six valence electrons, so we're going to put in six valence. Okay, and I think you can see where those two hydrogens are going to stick. One goes here, one goes here, and so it ends up looking like this. Kind of like an old water molecule, and we'll look at that here in a second. Okay, um, if we're looking at the uh, electronegativity difference. Uh, selenium is 2.4, hydrogen is 2.1, difference of 0.3. This has nonpolar bonds. Okay, well, here's spoiler alert. If the bonds are nonpolar, the molecule is nonpolar. You can't have a polar molecule if you don't have polar bonds. So, in looking at kind of this arrangement for the shape, Okay, effective pairs, one, two, three, four. We have four effective pairs, and we have uh, two lones. So I look at my diagram, four effective pairs go to two lone. This thing is bent. Okay, so that is a bent shape. If we look over here, the uh, I'm going to clear this out. We're going to put two things that's bonded to. We're going to slap a couple of lone pairs on there, and you're going to notice, yep, that molecule is definitely bent. Um, if these were polar bonds, this molecule would be polar because the two poles aren't equal and opposite. Like if, if the lone pairs weren't there, they would cancel. If it was linear, they'd be pulling equal and opposite against each other. But because of uh, these lone pairs, notice that when I add the lone pairs, it kind of bends those guys out of the way. You know, that's that VSEPR, that valence shell electron pair repulsion. Those electrons are pushing each other away and gives it this bent shape. So even though it's bent, because the bonds are nonpolar, the molecule is nonpolar. Uh, this will be the end of part one of this video. Maybe if I can shut it off, I guess we're going to find out. Here we go.